Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. We got to make a lot of noise because it'll help out with the, the background noise. Julia, thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, Miami is uh, where I'm born and raised, so I'm very familiar with this area. I'm one of the rare locals. And if we're just meeting, it's so great to meet you. My name is Ben Azadi. I am the best-selling author of four books. And I'm going to talk about metabolic flexibility and why that is one of the keys to longevity and feeling really good. So let's get right into this. I have a lot of slides, and you might tire out your arm trying to take photos, so I'm happy to send you all the slides so you don't have to do that. If you just email me, support at ketocamp.com, camp with the K, I'll give you all the slides. Just let us know it's from this event. First question is, why are so many people metabolically inflexible? Why is disease on the rise? And here are some stats. According to the CDC, one in three women are diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime. For men, one in two. At least 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. And you know it's a lot higher because people are walking around not testing their A1C. They're project projecting by the year 2032 that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. Harvard put out this article. They're projecting by the year 2030 that 50% of the American population would be obese. Not just overweight, but obese. So what's the problem here? Let's look at hospitals. For example, a cancer patient getting chemotherapy. They're given this type of Franken food which I would argue actually was probably part of the reason she was in there for the treatment. Hospitals allow fast food restaurants in them. It should be a place for healing. Hospitals should be a healing environment, yet they allow McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's. The question is why, we're gonna to get to that. Big Pharma is a cash cow. It's a brilliant business model that's very evil for the health of humanity. For example, Walgreens, or any supermarket or convenience store. Here's a simple example. We go to Walgreens, and what do we see? I think I have a little, yeah. We see a whole bunch of Franken food and Franken food products with, with artificial ingredients, seed oils, things we can't pronounce. People buy it because it's cheap and convenient. They eat that, then they come back to Walgreens to pick up the prescription for the symptoms they're dealing with because of the food they bought at the front of the store but it's pretty brilliant when it comes to business because they go back to the store, buy the food at the front, come back later, go to the back of the store. Front of the store, get more food, back of the store. They keep coming back. Third medication, fourth medication. And that's the sad truth. A cured patient is a lost customer. So I'm gonna start right here because I really believe our environment is crucial to our health and our longevity. And Neville Goddard said, we are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. I want to unpack that real quick. The subconscious mind, and this is going to tie into the metabolic flexibility, I promise. When we think about weakness of attention, we see mainstream news, which is fear porn, social media, friends, family, and coworkers, but we're going to focus on TV commercials. And I'm going to ask you a question here. I don't watch television, but my mom does. And I have dinner with her every Thursday. I go to her apartment, and she has her um, what's Lifetime. She loves that show, that TV show, our TV channel Lifetime and Hallmark. She likes those kind of fuzzy shows. So it's on TV, and I see the commercials, and I see all these big pharma commercials on TV, one after the other. So I wanted to do some research. I'm going to ask you the question to see if you know the percentage. What percentage of all cable TV commercials in the United States are funded by big pharma? 65%, who said 80? 80, anybody else? 85, 19, 90? Y'all are really close, it's 75%. At least in 2020, it probably is more after COVID. But 2020, 75% of the ad spend. Big pharma funds. Next question. Out of the 195 countries in the world, how many countries allow for big pharma to uh, show, market directly to the consumer. One, one, three. You say three, Amitai? You had it right the first time. Two, New Zealand and the United States. Only two countries in the world allow that. 
It's the only reason there's cable TV. If cable TV would not be around, everything would be streaming if it wasn't for big pharma. Now, other than these type of commercials, what percentage globally comes from fast food? What do you think this is? We already know 75% or so. So it's 11% plus. 11% to 29%, depending on the country. So in the US, it's about 11%. So pretty much every single commercial going into our conscious mind and subconscious mind is Big Pharma, Little Caesars, Papa John's, Big Pharma, Big Pharma, Little Caesars, Papa John's. It's, it's nonstop. And even if you know consciously, I don't eat fast food or I'm not gonna take that medication, the subconscious mind accepts everything. Everything. And that is going to determine your thoughts, you're, you're going to learn a little bit later about this. Your thoughts influence your actions. Your actions influence your results and your destiny. So another example of uh, how wrong it is out there. This came out from last year, Tufts University. Dr. Mosafarian from Tufts University who's trying to work with President Biden and the FDA to implement this chart. They're essentially saying items in green to be encouraged. Watermelon, kale, frosted mini wheats, non-fat yogurt, honey nut Cheerios. Items in yellow to be moderated, canned pineapple, whole wheat bread. Lucky Charms are in yellow. But in red, they say minimize ground beef, cheddar cheese, and butter. So what are they saying? They're saying Lucky Charms is healthier than beef and cheese. Do you believe that? No. Hell no. So the easiest thing to do because there's a lot of conflicting information in the health space, easiest thing to do, pay attention to what the government is telling you to eat and then do the complete opposite. Just like this, just flip it upside down and you're always going to be on the right direction. Have you ever watched Seinfeld, the George Costanza episode? The Costanza effect, same thing. They're saying watermelon is good. Well, the, here's the thing. Yeah, watermelon is fine. I have no issue with watermelon, but they actually allow these big food companies to actually be listed. Instead of saying cereal, they're actually listing these specific companies. So you can see there's a, some funding going on to influence this, but watermelon is fine. But what I'm saying is there's no way Lucky Charms is healthier than ground beef and eggs. Yeah, that's the, that's the point. And human beings are the only species smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to actually eat it. So here's one of my favorite quotes, and I think this is really important for the day and age that we live in. The illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and then relearn. A lot of what we've been taught, we need to unlearn and relearn. I know a lot of you are down that similar path. It's a, went down that allopathic path, and we realized that we have to unlearn that and relearn it, myself included. I always say this because I think it's important to take personal responsibility and I do believe if you treat your health casually, it's just a matter of time before you end up a casualty in one of those stats that I showed you earlier. And we don't want that. For, I don't want that for any of you. We don't, we're, we're not designed for that. So I want to talk about this before I get a little bit into some keto and some fasting in the way that I teach it. We have the symptoms that are above the surface, and there's thousands of symptoms out there that people deal with, but then we have what's underneath, the root cause. So an example of, sy of symptoms, imagine this scenario. Somebody went out last night, and they had an entire pizza, an entire pineapple, two slices of cheesecake, spaghetti and meatballs, 200 prunes, 50 strawberries, a pound of cheese, two cups of sauerkraut, and they have a whole bunch of symptoms now. They wake up with acid reflux, bo uh, bloating, they feel puffy, they have a headache, right? And she wakes up and she goes, I'm gonna contact my allopathic doctor. And she's explaining those symptoms to her doctor. Doc, I'm dealing with puffiness, I'm constipated, I have acid reflux. And the doctor, the allopathic doctor's listening. And at the end of the conversation, the allopathic doctor says, no worries, here is a prescription for five medications. Go to the Walgreens and go pick it up. But let me ask you this question. Were the symptoms the problem? Or is it a feedback mechanism from the innate intelligence? Feedback. feedback. Innate intelligence knows. Symptoms are a gift from the innate intelligence, the human body. It's the body's check engine light. Thank God we have these, this in the body. Symptoms are actually a good thing. And what allopathic medicine fails to see is that symptoms shouldn't be covered up. We should find out what is the cause, pull the car over, 
and look underneath the hood to see why that check engine light was on. And that's what we're talking about here, root cause. So how do you achieve metabolic flexibility? What is metabolic flexibility? To me, the definition is your mitochondria are really efficient at using sugar when it wants to and fat when it wants to. In other words, ketones or glucose and going back and forth without a hiccup, which is the way we were born into this world. I'm gonna make the case here. So this study came out in 2018. It was a 10 year study with over 8,000 people from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They wanted to determine how healthy or how unhealthy is the American adult population. And you could see, they said only 12% of American adults are metabolically healthy. Now let me ask you all this. This was before COVID. Do you think it got better or worse after COVID? Much worse after COVID, right? Some recent studies suggest up to 93%. But I'm going to rewrite this, and I'm going to make the case here for keto. I'm going to say 88% of American adults are in a keto deficiency. And when I talk about keto, how many of you have done keto before? Let me just get a general, keep your hands up. I know you have, I'm going to tie. Okay, so about half of you. I'm very non-dogmatic about keto. As a matter of fact, I speak at a lot of keto conferences and low-carb conferences, and some of them don't even want me back because I'm not dogmatic, and I think we shouldn't be in ketosis forever, and I'll explain why. But keto is a very important metabolic process. It's not a fad diet. I don't even look at it as a diet. I look at it as a metabolic process that every single one of our ancestors went through. There's nothing new about it. It's just nuanced or maybe new to some people, but there's nothing new about keto. And if you could put keto in a pill, or the benefits of keto in a pill, you better believe Big Pharma would be all over it. So that's the real fad diet, the standard American diet, which is the SAD diet. I'm going to make the case here, because look, babies that are breastfed are actually in a state of ketosis. And those are three PubMed studies. And you might, the argument is this, but Ben, there's sugar in breast milk, and that is true. But the baby is so efficient at utilizing that sugar, it actually goes in and out of this ketosis this ketogenic state, because it's very important for the neurological development of that baby's brain. So there's nothing new about keto. Let's talk about the mitochondria now. We understand the mitochondria as this energy factory. It receives fuel sources and it produces energy called ATP. There's much more to the mitochondria. It's actually, there's a intelligence to the mitochondria, but it is true, it does produce energy and it's very important to have your mitochondria producing quality ATP, using that, and having an abundance of healthy mitochondria. So let me ask you this. Out of these two options, glucose on the left, ketones on the right, which one will get you farther? Which one would you choose? Well, when we look at the electron transport chain, which is how your mitochondria produce energy, a molecule of glucose gets you about 32 to 36 ATP units. Compare that to a molecule of ketones, you get about 120 to 160 ATP molecules. That's about 400% more energy. That's why when people do keto, one of the first things they report, I have this, this mental clarity. Well, why? Because the brain has the highest concentration of mitochondria. That's the first thing you notice. But also, when you raise your cellular energy, it raises your basal metabolic rate, and you burn more calories just sitting down. Combine that with lowering of insulin, it's, it's an effective way to lose extra weight. And one of the reasons is because when you're in a state of ketosis, it's a stressful state. And I know a lot of you, and I know you especially have heard of hormesis, and this is the same thing with keto, meaning you apply a stress, your body adapts to that stress, like exercise, you get stronger. Keto is a stress to the mitochondria. It signals times are tough. You're going through a famine and it stresses the mitochondria and it creates more mitochondria. And that's where you get more ATP. So you have all of these healthy mitochondria reproducing. Here are some more studies on keto. It raises intracellular glutathione, reduces inflammation, repairs the inner mitochondrial membrane, cellular energy, we spoke about that. It's more metabolically efficient and cleaner than glucose, turns on the SIRT1 gene, and so on and so forth. One of the biggest uh, mistakes, not mistakes, but people are afraid of keto and eating healthy fats and protein because they're afraid they're going to get heart disease. And this is an interesting study because it shows the complete opposite. It shows that ketones may provide supplemental fuel for the energy-starved heart. Their cardiovascular effects appear to extend far beyond cardiac energetics. Indeed, ketone bodies have been shown to influence a variety of cellular processes, including gene transcription, 
inflammation and oxidative stress, endothelial function, cardiac remodeling, and cardiovascular risk factors. The heart is also loaded with mitochondria. So when you think about mitochondria, ketones are a powerful signaling molecule for the mitochondria. So let's get into some four simple keto secrets, and then we're gonna move into fasting, and then the most important part is the end, and I have a gift for you all as well. So here we go. Number one, uh, before I explain that, I've taken thousands of students through a keto protocol, men and women, and men and women should definitely do it differently. And women who have a menstrual cycle do it differently than postmenopausal women. And I've learned this since 2013 teaching keto and, 28, and 2008 teaching health in general. So I'm going to extract four secrets from thousands of individuals that have essentially been uh, our guinea pig here, including myself. And here are the four secrets. First one is your liver is very important. It's a very important detoxification organ, especially on keto, because when you eat more dietary fat, the liver produces bile to break down the dietary fat. And that bile is important to break down the fat because we want to absorb and assimilate those fat, fatty acids, vitamins A, D, E, and K. And a lot of people, I call the liver the soccer mom organ because it does everything for us like a soccer mom. A lot of people have beat up the liver, medications, alcohol, processed carbs, and now they increase their fat. They can't break it down because they have this hepatic biliary sludge, which is toxic bile, and they feel awful. So a simple solution is this. Eat more bitters. Bitters for the liver. Always remember that. If you're increasing your fat or you suspect you have some, uh, a sluggish bile, or if you have no gallbladder, very important because the liver is still producing bile, so you want to really support it, any of those bitters would do. You know, one of my favorite things to do is you could just smell these basil, thyme, and rosemary, and it produces some of these enzymes that you're looking for. Apple cider vinegar is a powerhouse for this, and also glucose, postprandial glucose. Second one, eat the right fats. Just because it's keto-friendly does not mean it's health-friendly. How many of you know Dr. Kay Shanahan? Have you read her book, Deep Nutrition? Yeah. She's a friend of mine, and she was Kobe Bryant's nutritionist for the Lakers. She wrote a fantastic book called Deep Nutrition. It's a classic if you haven't read it get it, and I asked her this question. I said, Dr. Kate, three scenarios. Which scenario will lead to disease, cancer, autoimmune, diabetes, and death faster? Scenario number one, somebody smokes cigarettes every day. Number two, somebody who eats processed sugar every day. Or number three, somebody who eats vegetable oils every day. What did she say? Yeah, y'all are smart. If you ask the average person, they would not say vegetable oils. She laughed when I asked the question, and she said, that's easy. It's the vegetable oils. She said, smoking's not good for you, obviously, but pretty much that once you finish the last puff, damage is done, and you're not storing that in your body fat, the cigarette smoke. Sugar is not good for you, but what happens when you eat cupcakes? Two hours later, that glucose goes back down. You could exercise and burn it off, whatever. But these vegetable oils, the half-life, meaning if you stop eating them today, 680 days later, half of them will still remain in your body fat around your mitochondrial membrane, creating inflammation. So it has about a two to five year shelf life in your body. That's why she believes they're worse than sugar and smoking. And I agree with her. And here I have a gift for you in a second. You're going to love it. But here are the oils I'm talking about. They're called polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6 fats. They're very unstable. PUFAs. So think of PUFAs. They go poof. That's how I learned it from Dr. Kate. It makes you remember it. Poofas go poof, they oxidize. They're very unstable. So you can see here a list of all the poofas we want to avoid. Canola, which is called rapeseed oil in the UK. Corn, soybean, cottonseed oil, safflower. We might argue at the bottom here of the list here, with me and Amatai, we have arguments about fish oil, but I put fish oil there too. Peanut oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed oil, and rice bran oil. We could swap those for saturated fats and monounsaturated fats. Like, as such, olive oil, avocado oil. Just make sure they're not cut, because a lot of these avocado oil and olive oils are cut with vegetable oil, so make sure it's 100% glass, dark bottle. Uh, butter and ghee are my favorite. Duck fat is also a favorite of mine, and beef tallow, lard, and coconut oil. Here's the gift. When I go to restaurants, what do they cook with? Even fancy restaurants, veg yeah, vegetable oils, right? Even the fanciest restaurants. So, 
For years, I would tell the server, hey, I'm allergic to canola, soybean, whatever you use. Can you use butter or coconut oil? And they usually accommodate. And my fiance rolls her eyes at me because it annoys her when I do that. She's used to it now. But I've shared this with my students for years. Do the same thing. Tell them you're allergic. And they feel uncomfortable. So I made it easy for everybody where you could download a seed oil card. And if you could scan it or go to seedoilcard.com, I actually have a few printed out. So for those of you who are here, let's see how many do I have. You could, you could see right here, it says, I have food allergies to those vegetable oils. The following alternatives are safe. So list the bad ones and it uh, shows the good ones. So I don't know how many I have, I have here, but you could take one and pass it along. So that's my gift for you all. Yes, you're very welcome. And then you can get the other ones digitally on that website. All right, tip number three, remove these specific keto foods that are causing inflammation and weight loss. Spinach and almonds. Who knows why I have that listed? O oxalic acid, oxalates, yeah. Yeah, oxalates, yeah. They are high in oxalates. And for me, I personally don't do well with high oxalate foods. Oxalates are these tiny crystals, they're anti-nutrients that chelate minerals and can make your leaky gut worse if you have leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So I've noticed with my students, when we remove these, it actually creates a beneficial response. So what do you swap them with? These have a better nutritional profile, less anti-nutrients, especially macadamia nuts. Those will probably be the best on this list. But any here, any of the items here, walnuts, pecans, Brazil nuts, peely nuts. Pistachios, pistachios um, I'm not a big fan. Uh, who, who asked that? Yeah. Some people have histamine sensitivity and there's more histamines than pistachios, but it depends. If you eat them and you feel fine, go for it. They're better than almonds in, in my book. And then if, cashews are okay too. And instead of spinach, arugula, which is my favorite one there, dandelion greens, bok choy, broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Now cow dairy, 75% of the adult population in the world cannot process pasteurized cow dairy. 75%, we lose the ability as we grow up. Raw dairy could be okay for some people, but I like to swap cow dairy with my students for sheep and goat dairy. Now here's the cool thing about sheep and goat dairy. Most people could digest it easy, and it contains 30% medium chain triglycerides, which actually help boost ketones, which is the goal for people doing keto. So any of these are fine instead of uh, uh, pasteurized dairy, and uh, instead of the almond milk, macadamia, nut milk, and coconut milk. Okay, fourth secret. Don't stay into ketosis for too long. This is where I get some heat from my fellow keto educators. I think keto is great, but metabolic flexibility is the goal. We want to teach the body to be metabolically fit and efficient so we could have days where we carb up for specific reasons and then we go back into a fat burning state. And here are four reasons why, and there's many more reasons, but when you're constantly burning fat and that's your only fuel supply, your body will actually slow down fat burning for survival. So it hit, you hit a weight loss stall with long-term ketosis. Number two, thyroid issues. The thyroid, the brain tells the thyroid, the thyroid to produce T4, which is the inactive version of thyroid that needs to be converted to T3. What a lot of people don't understand is that insulin actually helps to make that conversion. So with chronically low levels of insulin, like long-term ketosis, that conversion doesn't happen efficiently. So strate strategically having what I call a keto flex day helps make that hormonal conversions, which also includes progesterone, and other hormones for that men um, menstrual cycle, by the way. There's also studies suggesting a buildup of 4-H&E, which is a nasty free radical when you're constantly oxidizing fat, not good. And then chronically high cortisol levels because the body needs to create gluconeogenesis and sometimes it taps into your adrenals to do that via cortisol. So we don't wanna do it long term. I don't have enough time to get into um, how to Keto Flex in and out. I have a book called Keto Flex if you want to get it. It's called Keto Flex Book, but I'm going to be around. I'll be here for the panel if you want to ask me questions on that specifically. Okay, next step fasting. How many of you practice intermittent fasting? Anybody fasted right now? No? Fasting? Right now? Yes, I stopped already. Okay, so you are fasted. Two minutes ago. Oh, you, oh, you just two minutes ago, so you just ate. <laughs> okay. I, I haven't eaten since yesterday at 4 p.m., I think. I didn't plan on it, but um, I like to be fasted when I speak, and I'm gonna explain why, but it's interesting. I was telling 
Jacopo, my video editor, I'm like, when I fast longer, I get cold. And there's a reason for that. There's some things happening, but I feel cold right now. Do you know the Guinness World Record for the longest recorded water fast? Over a year? Yeah, y'all are smart. Yeah, 382 days. 382 days. His name was Angus Barbary. He went on a medically supervised fast for 382 days. He went from 450 pounds on day one to 180 pounds, which, which is actually my weight right now, on day 382. Blood work looked good, electrolytes looked good. This is an extreme example to show you that the body's designed to skip some meals sometimes. He had a lot of fat on his body, so he had a lot of energy, but we have fat on our body. Even if we're pretty lean, we have enough stored energy. Fasting allows you to tap into that and so much more. Autophagy is a buzzword. Um, it's a very important process. That's the scientific definition. I'll give you an analogy that really makes sense, but biological process that removes the body's accumulated toxins and recycles damaged cell components. Now, here's how it works. We open up our refrigerator and we have groceries in them, in the fridge, that have expiration dates. The orange juice, the produce, every grocery has an expiration date. What would happen if we let all the groceries expire and we just left it there? And we went to Publix, supermarket, Whole Foods, and we bought new groceries and put it in front of the expired groceries and closed that door. It's gonna be nasty. It's gonna be a toxic environment. The human body is like this refrigerator. We have cells that have expiration dates. When we are in a fasted state or when we exercise or do certain things, we turn on this autophagy switch and it's the body's way of looking for expired cells, senescent cells, cells that are not functioning well, fixing them up or getting rid of them through apoptosis and producing a stem cell. It's incredible what's happening. That's why Dr. Thomas Seafried who wrote the book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, he said, seven day water fast once a year could reduce cancer risk by 95% with other lifestyle changes. That is a powerful quote. So Hippocrates said all disease begins in the, de in the gut and fasting is one of the best ways to stress the gut and create diversity, I'm gonna explain that. But Harvard came out with a study showing that all disease begins in the leaky gut. So fasting, is a great way to fix the gut. Let me give you an example here. Let's say her name is Stacy, and Stacy works a corporate job. She clocks in, she's working nine to five, she works eight hours, it's now 5 p.m., Stacy's exhausted, she's walking to her car, ready to go home, she's about to enter her car, and her phone rings, and it's her boss. Her boss says, Stacy, we need you to come back in, we got a new project that just came in, we need you to come back to the office and work another five hours. So she walks back to the office, for another five hours, it's now 10 p.m. She's so exhausted, going back to her car, same phone call, Stacy, we need you to come back in for another five hours. What would happen to Stacy if this kept happening for weeks? She would be destroyed. She would be exhausted. This is the same thing that's happening to our digestive system when we don't allow a break, meaning when we eat every two to three hours. The average American, by the way, eats 17 to 23 times per day. 17 to 23 times, how is that possible? They're not sitting down at a table and having a full meal. They're grazing the kombucha, the almonds, the celery sticks with peanut butter. I mean, I'm talking about healthy examples, but let's face it, most people are not. 17 to 23 times per day, overwhelming their digestive system like Stacy, not allowing it to recover. Fasting gives Stacy a month off of work. She comes back fresh, she's ready to go. The digestive system needs a break sometimes. So here's some studies showing fasting promotes bacterial clearance and intestinal IgA production in salmonella and in infected mice. This one shows that fasting turns white adipose tissue to, and it browns it to brown adipose tissue, meaning more mitochondria by shaping the gut microbiome and decreasing obesity. When you're in a fasted state, like I am right now, the body's pumping you full of energy. BDNF, which is this miracle growth for the brain. Your body is producing it because it wants you to be creative and alert and focused. So I, 26 hours fasted, my body thinks I'm in a famine. Let's give this guy energy and BDNF so you can go out there and hunt and kill, right? But my body doesn't know that I could hit my phone and have Uber Eats come in here in 30 minutes. It doesn't know about that. But this process, we're hardwired for the old school. So BDNF increases. Here's a study showing uh, how that happens during fasting. 
Counter-regulatory hormones increase, so insulin drops, and then you have your sympathetic tone, cortisol, human growth hormone. This is your body's way of pumping you full of energy and preventing your metabolism from shutting down. Blood flow is increased because you're not digesting food, so that energy is diverted to the brain, and so much more. Women do have to do this differently than men. We do it based off of the cycle. Uh, chapter 12 of my book, Keto Flex, is all about keto and fasting for cycling women and postmenopausal women. I don't have time to get into it, but we look at the month, the 28 day cycle and vary the approach. For example, the week before the period is the week not to do keto or fasting. That's the week to feast and build progesterone. I'm gonna answer questions after. Yeah, I promise I will. I'll get to all your questions. All right, the missing piece. This is the last part. What time is it? I need to know how much time I have left. 6.36? Cool, okay, I got enough time. This is the most important part. So I'm glad you stayed for this part. The missing piece, 95% of our success with health and life is, is mindset. I really believe that. The inner size, what I call the mental six pack. The rest is strategy. So let me ask you this, how many of you talk to yourselves every day? Raise your hand, raise your hand if you talk to yourself every day. Keep them up. Okay, put it down. Most of you raised your hand, but some of you didn't. And those, those who didn't raise your hand, you're thinking, do I talk to myself? I don't know if I talk to myself. I think I talk to myself. We all talk to ourselves, and the average person has 60,000 thoughts every day. That's a, that's a real stat from psychiatrists, 60,000 thoughts every day. Not only that, those same studies determine that 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts from yesterday, and 85% of them are negative thoughts. Stinking thinking. If your thinking is thinking, your dreams are shrinking. And we become what we think about, we really do. Dr. Bruce Lipton has proven this, that your thoughts are a frequency that actually communicate with your DNA to produce proteins. Let me explain that in a crazy way that he has science on. If it's a hateful thought, a negative thought, a stinking thinking thought, that communication to your DNA tells your DNA to turn on bad genes and produce inflammatory proteins. But if it's a loving thought, an abundant thought, a grateful thought, same signal sent to the DNA, but now it produces anti-inflammatory proteins. It protects your telomeres. So if we have 60,000 thoughts per day, we have 60,000 opportunities every single day to put the body in an anti-inflammatory state. The greatest biohack that I could ever teach is that right there, 60,000 thoughts. So you are the most influential person you'll speak to today. And it's also important to get clear on what's important to you, your purpose, and to live on purpose with that purpose. There's profound health benefits to doing the things you love to do. Purpose is a key. And one of my favorite quotes in the world is this one. In the absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by that daily trivia. I used to be obese. This is a true story. I used to be addicted to drugs and video games. I had no purpose. All I had was daily trivia. Once I got clear on my goals, my addictive personality, my addictive behaviors turned into a superpower. When you are on purpose with your purpose, you have energy whenever you need it. You don't need to get energy, you release that energy. It is so important for your health and your longevity and your mitochondria and your telomeres and your everything we talk about today to live on purpose with your purpose. Don't negate it. Last thing is this. There is a powerful supplement. I didn't see it in the vent. There's amazing vendors here, but I didn't see it back here. This vitamin is the best vitamin in the world. I take it every day. It's anti-inflammatory, helps with long COVID, helps with cancer, helps with diabetes. It's called vitamin G. And let me explain something real quick. This study showed, this is Dr. Joe Dispenda's work, a study on vitamin G took 120 people and measured their cortisol and IgA levels at the start and conclusion of a vitamin G supplementation workshop. As cortisol levels go up, a chemical called IgA goes down. IgA is a protein, it's important for protecting your immune system. It's constantly fighting a barrage of bacteria, viruses, etc. Bottom line, it says IgA is better than any flu shot, immune shot, etc. So here's what the study showed. During this four-day workshop, they asked 120 participants to move into an elevated emotional state, such as love and joy, and take vitamin G. 
for nine to 10 minutes, three times a day, to determine if they could reverse what they were looking at. And what they saw is, if we could elevate our emotional states, could we raise our immune system and reduce stress? Here's what they found. We discovered at the conclusion of the event that the cortisol levels of our participants dropped by three standard deviations and their IgA level, IGA level shot up an average of 52.5 to 86. Significant, measurable changes. They also looked at brain scans and saw 1,200 chemical reactions take place as soon as they took vitamin G, GABA, oxytocin, dopamine, when they took the supplement. This study showed vitamin G lowered blood pressure. Those who took vitamin G had lower uh, blood pressure levels than those who did not. This one showed it rate, uh, lowered A1C levels, which is the three-month average of your glucose, important for determining diabetes. Vitamin G lowered it. So where do you purchase vitamin G? What is vitamin G? <laughs> Clap it up for vitamin G, come on. It is not woo-woo at all. I'm telling you, those are real studies. You can verify it. Gratitude. It's a universal law. What you appreciate, appreciates. What you put energy to, expands. Whatever it is, good or bad, it'll expand. And the brain has a system in place called the reticular activating system, RAS. God put this in our brain because if we didn't have this to filter out all the stimulation, the brain would short circuit. There's millions of stimulation. So the RAS filters out what you've taught it to be important. How it works is you buy, you do research to buy a red car. You spend a lot of energy online, auto trader. I want to buy this car new, used, whatever it is. You make the decision to go buy the red Ford that we see here. You buy it off the lot and what happens everywhere you drive? You see that damn red Ford everywhere you go. And you're thinking, did somebody else, is everybody else buying this car because of me? Or this dress that I bought, I see this dress everywhere. No, you now activated the RAS to see it. It was always there. Meaning, if you are focusing on how much you hate this part of your body, or this person in your life, or all the things you are resentful for, you train your RAS to find more things to hate in your relationships in your life. But when you shift the energy to gratitude, to love, to appreciation, now all of a sudden the things you were resentful for, you're grateful for. All of a sudden your obstacles are opportunities. And it's all a shift in the RAS. So vitamin G allows for that shift. Can I play this 60 second video? Is there, is there audio? It's 60 seconds and I'm done. Yep, here you go. How do you think you lived to be 97? Like, how do you think you made it this many years? I Give her a clap, that's amazing, right? If there's one thing you take from my talk today, practice some vitamin G, but don't treat it like a checklist, treat, feel it, feel the gratitude. I used to treat it like a checklist and it's not as beneficial, but when you feel the gratitude and you experience it and you find new things to be grateful for, that's when the magic happens. I'm grateful for you all, thank you so much. I love and appreciate you all, thank you Julia.